Okay, good evening. I'll introduce myself in just one moment, but first I'd like to make an announcement about this space's accessibility. The community room is T-Coil enabled. If you have T-Coil enabled devices, please feel free. Uh, we felt welcome to switch them on at this time. If you don't have a T-Coil enabled device, but would like to use one of our headsets, we have made some available on top of the piano. It's over there. I'll also request that you silence your cell phones for the duration of this program. My name is Cliff Robinson, and I'm the Public Humanity Specialist here at the Princeton Public Library. Tonight's program was made possible in part with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The program follows from a focus which the library's team is putting on the theme of democracy for this national election year. The theme was introduced back in December at the 2023 Public Humanities Forum on Journalism and Democracy, but a number of other library programs are exploring democracy this month. A year-long book group devoted to foundational texts on ancient and modern liberal democracy, offered in partnership with the Catherine Project, launched on January 16th and will repeat each month for the rest of the year. And coming up this Sunday on January 28th, there will be an action fair for advocacy groups coinciding with the presentation of author Sam Daly Harris's revised and updated publication of his book, Reclaiming Our Democracy, Every Citizen's Guide to Transformational Advocacy. More events will follow this year, but tonight's program brings us home to New Jersey and this history of its democracy. It's my honor to present to you what promises to be a searching and meaningful conversation about the life of one notable New Jersey politician. Briefly, I want to introduce our two guests, William Fernickes, Bill, and Ingrid Reed. We are brought together tonight by the publication of Bill's new book, Clifford Case and the Challenge of Liberal Republicanism. Apart from this book, Bill has authored numerous articles, essays, and book reviews, as well as Children's Rights, a reference handbook with Beverly C. Edmonds, the Oryx Holocaust source, books, source book, and The Human Rights Imperative in Teacher Education, co-edited with Gloria Alter. I'll leave it to Ingrid and William to discuss his new title and its place within his intellectual profile. So that brings me to Ingrid. It is not enough to say that Ingrid is no stranger to Princeton. In fact, she is a great friend of the town. As a policy analyst focusing on New Jersey's civic affairs, she directed the New Jersey Project at Rutgers Eagleton Institute of Politics from 1996 until she retired in June 2010. Reed was a founder and board chair of New Jersey Spotlight, a civic journalism website designed to provide coverage of current state issues important to its communities, which merged with NJTV in 2018. She currently serves on the board of New Jersey Future, of which she is a founder and its first senior fellow. She chairs the Community Advisory Board of NJTV and serves on the NJAARP Advocacy Advisors Committee. I could go on about her accomplishments, but her presence here tonight, I'm sure, will speak for itself. So Ingrid, I'll hand it over to you at this point and let the conversation begin. Thank you both for being here. Okay, but I am delighted to say that it is an exciting book uh, to read because of the way Bill has chosen to um, give us all a phenomenal picture of a very impressive gentleman. I think we would refer to him as a gentleman today. Uh, and um, so I'm delighted that we're having a chance to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, and if you pick it up in the bookstore and feel that it's heavy, as I did, I want to reassure you that it is a most readable book because the way Bill has designed it, I, don't, I think it's his innate writing talent, is that every chapter is a short story. So you can pick it up one evening and say, gee, I would like to learn about this. And, uh, and there it is in one, in one chapter that you're completely enthralled and, and like a mystery of how will this turn out? <laughs> Will he get the votes and when? And, uh, and so I want to encourage you to read it. I'd like just to do a little survey. When people ask me, well, what are you doing next or something like that, I told them, well, I'm reading this really good book um, about Clifford Case. And every person pauses a little bit and sort of looks at me <laughs> and said, some, some people say, two people have said, wasn't he a Republican? I think I voted for him as the only Republican I've ever voted for. <laughs> uh, and then other people say, um, wasn't he important in New Jersey? Uh, or, or what should I know about him? I think that uh, 
that the person that you decided to write about uh, has a reputation, and people don't know why he has that reputation. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think people under the age of 50 have virtually no understanding of Clifford Keyes. Mm -hmm. And because he left the Senate in 1979, right. few people today, I think, really understand what he did. Because really, if you think about it, and I point this out in the book, uh, there's been no Republican in the United States Senate for 44 years from the state of New Jersey. Clifford Case was the final Republican elected to the U.S. Senate, which really was quite different because we had Republicans in the Senate going back into the 1930s, 40s, 50s, before Case was even elected to the Senate. And so he, he made it uh, uh, possible, but, but could you say um, a, a little bit uh, about um, I think Clifford Case comes across as a, a three-person personality in, in a way. One, and I'd like you to touch on each if you would, he had strong values. He knew why he wanted to do what he wanted to do. So if you say a little bit about his Dutch reform sure. heritage. Uh, and the other thing that surprised me, in fact, I think I said this to you when we first met, he was a politician. He knew how the political system worked. He respected the two-party system uh, and, um, and paid close attention. Today, when we think of people being a party person, uh, that's not really seen, I think, as a positive anymore. Um, but he saw it as important. Absolutely. Second thing. Yep. Um, if you want to, you can talk about the convention in 1960. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, and then he was a, a, a from, from what I've learned, uh, an incredible legislator. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to find out what a person does if they're in the Senate and they want to get something done, this is the book for you. Uh, it is amazing how you have to care about your colleagues, care about the opposition, think about the strategy. It might not be this year that you can get something done. And I think that there's some good examples. Uh, and the other thing about him as a legislator, he wanted to find out for himself what he should vote for. And we will, I think we should at least sure. talk about Cox Island and Vietnam. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I can talk about that first piece in, in order. OK, why don't we do that? Yeah. So uh, Clifford Case's father was a Dutch reform minister. And uh, I think he had a huge influence on his son. Mm -hmm. His father was very concerned with the social gospel, uh, interest in social welfare. In fact, when he headed the Six Mile Run Reform Church not far from here at Franklin Park, he set up a uh, connection with the missionary project in Japan through the Dutch Reformed Church. And then when he moved to Poughkeepsie and moved the family to a larger church, he continued that. Uh, so he was very concerned about the impact of daily life church could have, but also about good works of people. Mm -hmm. And his son, I feel, was very heavily influenced by that. Now, his father died when Clifford was only 16 years old. He died at a young age of 47 of pneumonia. And so then Clifford, only two years later, is at Rutgers. And you see in his activities at Rutgers, his work with the YWCA club, his work in the, his participation in the Glee Club and in the band, his in, a, involvement in athletics. And as a campus leader, he has this sense of community, this sense of leadership, not for himself, mm -hmm. but for others. Right. And I think that becomes very paramount in his life, very important. And I think uh, he was among the first to be openly uh, in favor of every person being valued, no matter what the color of their skin. Absolutely. And yes. uh, I think a number of times you make reference to um, him having very close ties to the NAACP and I guess even considering them uh, uh, their guide for him. Uh, uh, well, you said before, Ingrid, about if you want to look at what somebody accomplished, you have to see what they actually propose in legislation and what do they stand for. In 1948, Clifford Case proposed that there would be a federal bill outlawing lynching in the United States, making it a federal crime. This was not the first time that it had been proposed, but Southern segregationists had stopped it every single time including under the New Deal. So when Case proposed it, he felt it was a moral obligation. 
And he felt that the moral obligation was not only internal <coughs> in the United States, but how could the United States say to the United Nations, three years old at that time, that we stood for the values of anti-discrimination if we tolerated lynching? Mm -hmm. So I think if you look at that, then in 1952, he's asked to deliver the address of the Spingarn Award at the NAACP convention for, uh, in memory of two civil rights activists who were murdered in Florida. He had no political gain to do this, by the way. Nothing was going to benefit him. He wouldn't have gotten on social media. There wasn't any. He wouldn't have benefited with money. He did it because it was the right thing to do. And then he advocates, works with Clarence Mitchell, very important uh, lobbyist for the NAACP in Washington. And he goes on and is a key figure in passing the first Civil Rights Act since Reconstruction in 1957. A key figure because when the Republicans wanted to pass that, first of all, they had to get through the Southern segregationists. And I think if you've read Robert Caro's works on Lyndon Johnson, you get a real good taste of how important the Southern leaders of the Senate were, including Johnson. Oh, yeah. They controlled the committees. They controlled the legislation. Well, Johnson wanted to be president. And in 1957, this was one way to sort of bridge the gap between him being from the South and getting Northern Democrats on board. Well, he needed middle-of-the-road Republicans. He needed Clifford Case and Jacob Javits and people like that. So what he did was he asked Case and others, not Johnson, but the Republican leadership did, to work on the Civil Rights Bill. And in fact, at one point, Richard Nixon, who was vice president, was presiding. And the Southern segregationists, Richard Russell in particular, they knew the ins and outs of every Senate rule. They could go rings around the Northern Democrats on this. Well, Russell tried to stop the bill. Case went to Nixon and said, I have a way around it. Nixon listened to him, and they got around it, and didn't stop the bill from being considered. So in that way, I think Case not only said things, but supported it. He acted on them, right? And the other thing you mentioned, Ingrid, was I think that um, when you talk about his values, I think, uh, or I should say as a politician, Yeah. I think he brought his values with him as a politician, but he also was a realist. Mm -hmm. he, knew, much, yeah. he knew that he had to be able to get votes. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't going to sacrifice his principles either. So for example, in 1953, Case wanted to run for governor, but he couldn't get enough support from county chairpersons who were very supportive, very, very powerful in New Jersey, and many of them in the Republican Party were quite conservative. Mm -hmm. They thought Case was too liberal because he wasn't against the New Deal. He supported Social Security. Yeah. He supported labor management. He supported the Wagner Act. So what happened was that he didn't get enough money pulled out in March of 53. Later on, when he wants to run for the Senate, he realizes he has to do something. He needs to set up his own fundraising mechanism. So he creates what's called a Committee for Senator Case. He never relied on state money and state party money. But he also didn't alienate the state party. So for example, he knows that it's important to support state, municipal, county, and uh, other ones running for the state legislature. He would regularly come back to New Jersey from Washington, make speeches in support of county Republican groups, municipal elected officials, and so forth. So he knew that he had to sort of butter his bread with the Republican establishment but not sacrifice his principles at the same time. He, he acted that way in his first campaign, according to what, uh, what you wrote about. He was from Broadway. It's <laughs> very interesting when I mentioned to people. Somebody, somebody said, oh, well, where was he from, Morristown or something like that? I said, no, he was from Broadway. A couple of people said, oh, you mean that's the nice train station on the Northeast <laughs> corridor? And it's, uh, uh, and you said that at that time Union County was a Republican, Heavily Republican. But, but Rawway had a lot of working class people and uh, I think was run by Democrats. Yeah, when he was elected in 1938 to the Municipal Council, he was one of two Republicans and there were nine Democrats. He learned very quickly that in order to get anything done, he had to work with the Democrats. And I think you see that consistently because for only two years in the House, and one year in the Senate, Case was in the minority in federal office. Mm -hmm. So he really knew that you want to get something done, we have to compromise. Yeah. He, he even thought ahead. I, I, 
uh, as I understand it, if he couldn't get something from the Southern Democrats, that he waited until some kind of incident or some kind of other bill came up where he could help them so that there might be some reciprocity. Uh, well, interestingly enough, when he's in the Senate in the first term, one of the uh, issues that arises is should the, should the Republican Party seek to make alliances with Southern segregationists? In other words, try to convert so-called solid Southern Democrats to the Republican Party. And he argued very strongly, no. He says, we're going to sacrifice our principles to do that. The Republicans were the party of civil rights until the 1930s. He said, if we do that, then how are we ever going to appeal beyond that small number of people? Mm -hmm. And he wrote this uh, article that was published in the New York Times Magazine called Modern Republicanism mm -hmm. when he was in his first term, which was very much an Eisenhower idea, but also one that Case believed in. And he said, the Republican Party will become a minority party in the United States until we broaden our appeal beyond the traditional Republican constituency. Well, now that you mentioned Eisenhower, mm -hmm. um, you have to mention Nixon. And what do you think was really going on with Nixon <laughs> and, uh, and Case? Because um, there's a very interesting, I don't know if it's a whole chapter, but um, the fact that Case and Eisenhower, it, well, it sort of made me realize how difficult it is to get to the president. Mm. If, and I think, I think that's probably true today, too. Uh, but there was a concern. I think uh, you indicated, and I've read other places, that Eisenhower was really thinking very carefully about whether Nixon should be the uh, uh, nominee. Secretary of VP. Yeah. And, um, and, and had conversations with Case. Uh, well, I think what happened there is that um, Eisenhower, of course, had had a heart attack <clears throat> in his first term. And uh, they came to the realization, I think, that even though Nixon had some problematic issues in his past, he was still a loyal vice president. Mm -hmm. The interesting relationship between Nixon and Case is that Nixon came in 54 election, very close election, which Case won by only 3,500 votes. He campaigned for Case. Nixon did. Yes, he did, and he raised money for Case. Mm -hmm. And then in 60, Case was very strong for oh, Nixon. Sorry, yeah, that's all. In 19, you have to tell that whole story. In 1960, story. he's very strong for Nixon, even though Nixon loses by very few votes to Kennedy, right? He loses New Jersey to Kennedy. However, then Nixon goes into the wilderness because he runs for governor in California, fails in 1962 against Pat Brown, and he has the famous statement, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Well. Richard Nixon was a lot more clever than that because over the next five years, he rebuilt his connections in the Republican Party. He rebuilt them one state at a time, one party convention at a time, and by the time he gets to 1968, he wants that nomination. Well, Clifford Case and Webster Todd, who was the uh, state chairman of the Republican Party, he was the father of Christine Todd Whitman, who was former uh, governor. They decide that if New Jersey is going to have any impact at this convention, they have to have a favorite son candidate. Well, who is that? Clifford Case. That way, New Jersey's delegates can be held back to see who's sort of going in the forward or not. Do they want Nixon or do they want Rockefeller? Well, it was clear that Case liked Rockefeller. <coughs> so did Todd. Yeah. So what happens is that when they get to the Miami convention, Case and Todd are working day in, day out to keep the 21 delegates together in support of Case as a favorite son. Well, that doesn't work, because Nixon and his gang, including some New Jersey Democrats like Frank Farley from Atlantic City, they side with Nixon. And the delegation splinters, because by, by splintering, Nixon pulled away some of the delegates, and he's able now to get a first ballot victory. But before that, Clifford Case is actually nominated for president as a favorite son. So what happens is that the first ballot, Nixon wins. Case decides, OK, fine, he won. That's it. And they move on. During Nixon's first term, Case really is quite supportive of him up to a point. What I think led to his disenchantment with Nixon were two things. Number one, 
the Department of Justice moving away from supporting civil rights. And number two, Nixon's increasing hold on executive power and his reluctance to really work with the legislature on a number of issues. Foreign policy is one. Impounding funds is another one. And then I think the real break occurs here. Nixon nominates two Supreme Court justices, Clement Hainsworth and Howard Carswell, both of them from the South, because Nixon's goal was to replace the Supreme, or make the Supreme Court conservative. So those two appointments come up in the early part of his uh, first term. Well, Case votes no on both, and both of them are defeated. Republicans turned against Nixon, and Nixon was not a man to forget these things. And he really put a lot of pressure on people. But if you read the book and you see what Case said, he was very clear. Ainsworth was not going to change his views on segregation. Carswell was un not only was unqualified, but he was, I would argue, he was a bigot. So they get defeated. I think at that point, you see Case and Nixon are really divergent. Well, um, uh, and we didn't get into Vietnam. That's a whole other. Issue. Oh well, no, that would, that's we'll get there. Silent. We'll get there. We we'll get there. No, but um, Case learned a lot about conventions in 1960 uh, when uh, he was asked to. Uh, I mean, in '64, a gold border with a gold border convention. No, I'm talking. I'm talking about when Minor wanted to be the favorite. Oh, I'm star. sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, that was very early mm -hmm. that um, I happened to bring that up because I was in Los Angeles and a guest at the convention, and I never really knew what was going on there, but uh, uh, I've learned a little bit <laughs> about the fact that Minor wanted to be the nominee. Uh, for the Democrats. The, for the Democrats, and wanted to be the favorite son as, as the sort of 68 yeah. maneuver. It was, it was as though Case, when I read your book, was sounded like he was practicing about how you do this at the convention uh, to, uh, to, to manage your delegation and, yeah. uh, and so on. But um, well, what's he, he what's wasn't able to really right. do that. So. What's interesting is that today we have virtually no experience of contested right. conventions. There are basically shows of ceremony mm -hmm. because there's no debate. Mm -hmm. The person's been, excuse me, <clears throat> the person's been chosen already, and they just get to coronation. Mm -hmm. The last contested convention, and we talk about it in the book, yeah. was 1976. Mm -hmm. Reagan challenges Ford. Mm -hmm. Since then, there have been no contested conventions other than the Democrats in '80 mm -hmm. with Carter and Ted Kennedy. Yeah. But we used to stay up late at night to find out who actually got the most votes. Right. And, uh, um, but the, the lore around New Jersey is that with uh, the delegation not holding for Minor, but Kennedy being upset that they didn't come out sooner mm -hmm. for, for Minor, meant that New Jersey didn't get as much money. And Kennedy never showed up in New Jersey during his whole short term and uh, so there are consequences of uh, sticking with your values and so well, on. you know what's interesting about that is that when um, Richard Hughes runs for governor mm -hmm. in 61 and I would argue this is one of Case's major mistakes in his career. He didn't have a lot but this is one of them. Uh, Case won in 60 overwhelmingly against a guy named Thorne Lord who was the Mercer County uh, Democratic Chair and who had the full Democratic establishment behind them, but the case crushed them. In 1961, the Republicans want to regain the, the governorship because Minor had been in for two terms. He couldn't run again. The problem was that who were they going to choose? So Republican establishment <clears throat> figures like Senator Walter Jones, yeah. Wayne Dumont from Warren County, they're running for the nomination. Case says, I know better. We're going to bring in Jim Mitchell. Jim Mitchell was a Secretary of Labor under Eisenhower. He lived in New Jersey, but he had never run for office. Well, Case says he'd be great. He's a federal official, the connection with Eisenhower. He'll bring Democrats, he'll bring independents, we'll win. Mitchell runs the primary, he wins. He runs a disastrous campaign against Hughes, and Hughes loses, and the coup de grace, Kennedy comes to New Jersey in 63 for Hughes, <laughs> one week before the election. And that's the end of it. And then 
Mitchell is so sort of knocked out by this, he won't even come down to talk to his supporters when he loses. Mm -hmm. It was sad. Mm -hmm. But Case, I think, thought he had more to, yeah. he could sort of push his guy, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a mistake. Yeah. And uh, by the way, for, for years, people said, remember that? Cliff, remember what you did with uh, Jim Mitchell, right? We lost the governorship. Um, I hope this isn't too inside ball game, but I see everybody smiling as though it's a lot of fun. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see that. Uh, but um, but I think it's interesting that uh, that Clifford Case, in the public image, or when you think of him, you think of him as a good guy and supporting good causes, being sensible, mm -hmm. uh, having values that you associate with. Um, not with Republicans uh, necessarily. And, today. Yeah, yeah, today. And, um, but yet, he was very skilled as a politician. He understood that, except in his <coughs> final run. And we'll save that to the end, sure. because that's a, a really <laughs> interesting thing. Um, the, uh, the other thing that, uh, at the very end of the book, you do it with us, not quite an end note, but there's a section after you sort of have, um, if it were a movie, Case walking into the sunset, <laughs> sort of, uh, uh, that I think for today we should just lift out and let people read. One is Case's support for Israel. Mm -hmm. And the other one is his ongoing commitment. And I think in New Jersey, particularly, we should read that for an ethics code that is enforceable uh, uh, in, in, for, for government, high government officials. Not just a statement of you should be good, but you have to do this. And, uh, and a, a whole set of procedures for holding people accountable. Well, he, uh, to start with that, he... So that's six pages, but, yeah. but it's worth reading. Yeah. Well, I would argue that, you know, he, first of all, there was no requirement in the 1950s for um, government officials to pu public publish their finances. Zero, nothing. In 1958, Clifford Case introduced a bill that required all members of the executive branch and legislature, and then later on, they had the Supreme Court publish their finances. Had to. Oh, this was an outrage. Why should anybody? Edward Dirksen said, what is this? Why are we doing this? Why should they know how much money I have and so forth? 20 years later, it finally was enacted after Watergate. But Case felt government transparency was essential. You had to know what people were indebted to. Who were they paying their money to? Where were they getting their income? What's wrong with that? He published them in the congressional record. He put his own finances out voluntarily in 1957. So I think, you know, he was an outlier, but persistence paid off. Now, sort of. Yeah, on Israel, it's an interesting issue. You know, the United States recognized Israel in 1948. Cases in the Congress, in the House, and one of the things that comes up soon in the Truman administration is what are we going to do about this huge refugee problem in Europe, enormous after World War II, and in Asia? Well, the United States in the 1920s had enacted the National Origins Act, which was extremely restrictive. For example, it banned people from China. It continued the, the discrimination against people from all over parts of the world, except for certain parts, Northern Europe in particular. Well, the Congress passed a law or a bill that said, we're going to allow refugees, but they made very restrictive provisions and focused on certain groups in Eastern Europe and others, and basically excluded Holocaust survivors. Well, Truman was aghast, but he signed it because he said, we have nothing else we can do, we got to do this. Well, Case said, this is absolutely wrong. And two years later, they had an amendment passed which eliminated some of those restrictions. Case was a forceful advocate for this. He went to Europe, by the way, and examined what was going on, supported the Marshall Plan and all this. That's one example. But then later on, he is a steadfast supporter of Israel, not only in terms of Israel, but in terms of combating anti-Semitism, particularly in the Soviet Union. In the 1970s, I don't know if you remember this, but the Soviet Union imposed a tax on Jews who wanted to leave. And they refused to allow, and Anatoly Sharansky, famous refuseniks they called him, couldn't leave. He was sent to jail. They said he was working against the state. 
Well, a case railed against this in the Senate, and in the 1970s, a bill was passed called the jackson vanik Act, which put some pretty harsh trade restrictions on the Soviet Union. Well, case supported that. But his support for Israel was rock solid, and no question. Mm -hmm. And you wonder what he would say today when he cares for, and he understood the, uh, the whole treaty making that uh, was tried several times. Absolutely. He supported Carter's view, Carter's, uh, the uh, Camp David. You know, he was critical of Carter on other things, but he, he was strongly supportive of Carter on human rights mm -hmm. and on the Camp David Accords. Uh, and I, I never really uh, had heard this, and it's in this very short section, uh, uh, that um, the, the Carter effort really involved a contest over who should get uh, military aid. Mm -hmm. And it involves the parties that we know today. You know, you give Israel planes at the same time that you give planes to Saudi Arabia so that you have their uh, cooperation, right. and, um, and, and Case <clears throat> thought that was not fair. He felt it was going to tip the scales against Israel by giving Arab states like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan too many arms, right. and advanced arms, right. He did, and he opposed the Reagan sale, too. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, closer to home, uh, you uh, give two powerful examples of Case having to find out for himself what's <coughs> going on. And also, Case wrote a lot. He, he committed, yes. he, he did his own reports. You know, I, I don't want to just say this, I want there to be a public record of what I found out and what I did or what I couldn't do. And uh, how many of you remember Tox Island or you know what it meant to New Jersey? A few, few people. Oh. It, it involves the Delaware, right? And a big dam. And my camp was flooded and had to get out of there because the park wanted my camp. Um, but um, that was one case where uh, it was very a contested issue in, in, in Congress. And a, lot of, and a lot of the people who were used to building lots of dams thought it was just fine. Why not? And the big dam in the east, they would be grateful. What's going on here? And, um, and, and he went and, and saw for himself. Yeah, well, in 62, he supported it. He, he, said he gave testimony in support of the proposed National Recreation Area. But by the late 60s and early 70s, he saw that there were going to be serious impacts here. In fact, when Cahill became governor, he started to have real reservations. And Case and Williams, Harrison Williams, started to think carefully about, well, what's the benefit of this? Mm -hmm. And the Army Corps of Engineers, excuse me, <coughs> had um, purchased a lot of and condemned a lot of these buildings. Well, not only had they condemned them, but the people who were living there couldn't sell them. Yeah. And so Case said, well, what are these people supposed to do? And they, he tried to get money for them from Nixon to help these homeowners. But over time, and I think this is a key characteristic of Case, he changed his mind and felt the environmental damage was not in the public interest. He was not the type of person to say, I'm here today, I believe this. Tomorrow, oh, now I'll believe that. No. He had a slow, deliberative process for decision making. And he gradually moved away from that. In fact, sponsored the uh, bill to uh, deauthorize it. And finally, it was named the National uh, Scenic uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers pro uh, Program in his, in his last term. Yeah, it's still controversial of what to do with the park there. But, okay. you know, but, but I mean, there, there is, you can have that discussion now. Yes. We couldn't have had it if, if the dam had gone through. Well, let me say one other thing, and that is, Kimber Case was an environmentalist before the term was known. Mm -hmm. He believed that it was important to have a harmonious relationship between urban life and the natural world. He supported restrictions on ocean dumping. He supported creation of the Great Swamp Area. He supported the Gateway National Recreation Area. He was very committed. And he was not the type of person who said, oh, now I'm an environmentalist because it's popular. No, he was way ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. right. So, and that was very important in New Jersey. There were a lot of scientists that were saying that this was not the way to treat the water, mm -hmm. our, our water. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they, they were very skeptical of case. Uh, I don't know if there are any here tonight. They changed their minds, but... Uh, uh, I, I think it was it was certainly a demonstration of what he did later. Mm -hmm. 
which is going to be a Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, this is, I think, um, one of the pivotal parts of his career. In the early 60s, Clifford Case, just as he had done in the 50s, was a very strong supporter of U.S. containment policy of communism. Now, by the mid-60s, he's really not talking about Vietnam. Well, as you know, in 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution is passed by Congress. Case voted for it. There were only two votes against it in the Congress Senate. It was 98 votes in favor, two against. Ernest Gruning from Alaska and Wayne Morse of Oregon voted against it. And basically, what it did is it gave Lyndon Johnson a blank check to conduct the war. Over the next few years, Case becomes increasingly skeptical because the administration is giving this very positive spin. Robert McNamara goes to Vietnam, he comes back, and even though he knows it's not working well, he gives this positive response to the public. And later on, of course, we find out that he had commissioned a report called the Pentagon Papers later that is being written at this time, which is revealing all the lies the United States government, starting with Truman and going right up to then, is telling the public about this. Okay, so in 1967, <clears throat> Case had been appointed to the Foreign Relations Committee in 1965. He says, I'm gonna go to Vietnam and find out for myself. So he goes to Vietnam in, the May, in May of 1967, not only there, he goes to Thailand, he goes to Japan, yeah, the Philippines, countries, yeah. but mostly in Vietnam. And he says, I'm gonna find out for myself. And that's what he does. He talks to American diplomats, he talks to American soldiers, he talks to Vietnamese refugees, he talks to Vietnamese soldiers, he talks to Vietnamese government officials, he talks to civilians in various parts. And when he comes back, he says, we are in for a long, and difficult road. And anybody who thinks otherwise, I think you should reevaluate them. And I'm paraphrasing. But at that point, you start to see the shift that in September 26, 1967, he rises in the Senate, he gives a speech where he's severely critical of the Johnson administration. And he says, they have created a credibility gap with the American public because they are not telling what's really going on. And he says, not only are they not telling us what's really going on, they're doing nothing to support democratic reforms in Vietnam because the, the South Vietnam government was corrupt. No question, it was corrupt. And what happens is that as he's giving his speech, all these other senators start streaming back into the Senate chamber and they're challenging him. This goes on for three hours. The only one to stand up support him is Jacob Javits. But all these other people are saying, why are you, you're this, what John Stennis says, you're disloyal. Well, I'm in the LBJ library in Austin when I'm doing research, I'm working on cases. Somebody comes up to me, another archivist, he says, I think you should see this. He gives me a box, and in the box is a report, 50 pages long, written by the Johnson administration to rebut every single point case made in that speech, because they were so concerned that a moderate Republican like Case was turning against Johnson, they thought this would be the beginning of other moderate Republicans. Well, that was true, because over the next few years, particularly with the hearings that Fulbright ran with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, you start to see the hypocrisy of the administration's point of view. You start to see that, and then when Nixon becomes president, you start to see the questioning of Vietnamization, this idea of peace with honor, at one point, when uh, Dean Rusk is testifying, Case asks him, Mr. Secretary, do we have to destroy Vietnam to save it? That's a very powerful question, I think. Mm -hmm. And so over a period of time, over about four years, Case had been sort of a minority voice critical of the war. More and more senators, Stuart Symington for one, others, Republicans, start to say, What's really going on here? And so you get to the point in the early 70s where in 1972, Nixon's reelected. By that time, more people had died under Nixon's administration in Vietnam than had died before. And the public is saying, what's happening here? So to quickly move this on, the Nixon administration secretly negotiates with North Vietnam. They get a peace agreement in 73. However, Nixon 
and engaged in the, the secret bombing of Cambodia and invasion of Laos. These have been failures. So the senators say, we have to put a way to stop this. We're going to cut the money off. So in 73, Nixon and Frank Church from Idaho put an amendment to a bill saying, there's going to be a def definitive end time. We're going to cut off the money as long as we get an accounting of all MIAs, a return of POWs. Okay? Well, gradually that gained steam, and by July of 73, Nixon signs it. And that was a struggle that really, I think, defined Case as a bipartisan legislator, but also somebody who saw the interest of the country over the right. interest of one party, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it went back to his values <clears throat> exactly. uh, of, exactly. caring, of, of caring. I mean, I think he was really, the way you wrote it, moved by the devastation mm -hmm. that people, that ordinary people who had no say in it and weren't going to have any say, and soldiers who had no say in leading the troops. Uh, and that was just too much. Uh, and he, you know, he said also, I don't have a criticism of why we got involved. He believed that the STEM communism was a good thing, yeah. but he said, after a point, why are we doing this? Yeah. There's more damage than what's being done, right? And the country was divided. Yeah. Uh, we would like to show some of your uh, sure. slides, but, or, <clears throat> but, you know, we never got to the question of, how did you get started on this? Oh, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> I was reading, I was Let's preparing. start all over again. In, two, <laughs> in 2003, I was uh, working at Hunter Central as supervisor of social studies, and I was reading up on uh, civil rights, and I was reading this book by Philip Dre. It was about lynching. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading, and I read this part, and it says the last person to sponsor anti-lynching legislation was Clifford Case. Well, that's interesting, because I knew Case's papers were at Rutgers, so I went down, I started to look, and I said, it's an interesting man. And I said, is there any biography? No. And so we started working on it, and then uh, 20 years later, here it is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it was, 20 years later, and traveling all over the place. Yeah, seven, pre seven presidential libraries, interviewing staff members. Um, and I have to say one thing, that uh, just to make sure I say it, if none of you have ever been to a presidential library, or to the National Archives, or to the Library of Congress, you really need to go. These are tremendous investments in our country. The archivists are superb. They are working with us on all this research, but preserving the documents and the museums. It's a tremendous investment in the country. And I know some people, I'm not saying you do, but some people think, well, you know, government spends too much money. They should spend twice as much as what they're spending now on the National Archives and all these facilities. They do tremendous work. And the other thing I just wanted to say in conclusion is yeah. that <clears throat> the Case family has been marvelous. Uh, you know, when uh, Martin Duberman wrote the book on Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. he had to actually have a contract with Paul Robeson Jr. that Paul Robeson Jr. could not change anything in Duberman's manuscript because he was very protective of his father. Duberman came to conclusions Paul Robeson Jr. didn't agree with. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, the Case family was superb. They loved the fact I was doing it. I gave them all the manuscript. They read it. Some grammatical corrections. Okay, fine. But nobody said, oh, take this out. Remove this. Don't talk about that. No. They were superb. And I have to say, they're a wonderful group of people. His wife died in 2001. His older daughter, Mary Jane, died about 10 years ago. But his younger daughter, Anne, lives in Clinton. And his son, Clifford Case III, lives in New York, although well, he's not in very good physical condition right now. Right. And there is a Clifford Case professorship right. at, um, at right. Eagleton. Uh, and it's designed to bring a colleague, if possible, there are fewer and fewer colleagues, but uh, political and public leaders of um, the kind of values that Case had to the campus <coughs> for a week and our um, and the program is then managed by, by Eagleton. So um, sometimes I sort of, now having read this, I was thinking that maybe we could cast Clifford Case in It's a Wonderful Life and give <laughs> James Stewart a little break for a while. <laughs> uh, because it, 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 I, I don't really want to laugh about this, to have people who care so much, who, who really want the world to be a better place, 
and, and try to find a strategy for that. They don't give up. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really quite remarkable. So well, one thing I think before we go to the slides yeah. I should mention is that people might ask the question about uh, the second part of the title, the challenge of liberal republicanism, and I thought I'd mention right. this. Clifford Case, Charles Mathias, Jacob Javits, Thomas Kugel, um, and a bunch of other Republicans from the post-war period were really very essential members of the Senate in getting things like the Civil Rights Act passed. People forget that at that time, a filibuster needed 67 votes. Not 60, 67. So Case and those middle-of-the-road Republicans were very critical in moving legislation forward in, as a compromise centrist group, right? Today, the center of American politics has been hollowed out. It's really weak. And I think the reason that we don't have these people anymore goes to two factors. Number one, in contrast to the conservative movement, the liberal Republicans never built an infrastructure like the Heritage Foundation or the Federalist Society, big money that was behind them, to develop a national movement. And I think that was a weakness because each of these people on their own were very good, but they weren't a movement. They used to meet on Wednesday morning in the Senate called the Wednesday Breakfast Club, but their influence was not necessarily a movement, right? Not with a structure, it was individual. And the second thing is that by the time you get to the late 70s, that conservative movement has mobilized and created mechanisms to destroy the liberal Republicans. One of them comes up in, the, in his run against Bell yeah. in 1978. Yeah, we, we did talk about that. Jeffrey Bell runs against Case as a Reagan protege in the 78 primary in New Jersey. He comes back to New Jersey specifically to do this because he had worked for Reagan. Well, he didn't raise a lot of money in New Jersey. He raised most of his money nationally through a national direct mail campaign run by Richard Vigory, who was a conservative direct mail operator. This is one of the first times this happens. Plus, you see conservative Republicans writing letters to New Jersey Republicans saying, you're in a case, he's too liberal. So there's a nationalization of the movement to get rid of specific senators. In fact, in that campaign, Matthias and other moderates write to Bill Brock, the head of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and say, are you going to support us or not? And he said, yes. But the problem was that this sort of national conservative grassroots movement, which began with Goldwater, never died. And they were working to get rid of liberals. So you see that gradually advance. Case is one of the first people they claim as a victim, right? And then it goes on. You have none left. By the year, by the time Barack Obama is elected in 2008, I would say maybe there were one or two left. And I'd say today, the only one who I think has the independence of mind that resembles Case is Lisa Murkowski. Because she ran as an independent against the Republican Party in Alaska. She's conservative, but she's an independent thinker. And I don't think she's going to sacrifice her values. And the other one on the Democratic side is Angus King who I think is that he's an independent yeah. in Maine. But you don't see very many of these people anymore. <clears throat> I asked Christine Todd Whitman in an interview when I did the interview for the book, I said, well, why didn't you run for the Senate after you left the EPA? She said, I was told I wasn't going to get any money because she was too liberal. I wouldn't call her a liberal. She was a moderate Republican leaning conservative. But I think today, that's one of the reasons why, those two reasons, I think, why you see this paucity of liberal Republicans. Right. And Case didn't see it coming. Uh, right. Because he was quite confident about campaigning. He campaigned, he campaigned from Washington. Mm -hmm. And he didn't realize the seriousness and the aggressiveness of Bell. And I think he, he realized it too late. Oh, I must say that. Um, he had commissioned a poll that showed he was going to win, and the other polls showed, but of course, polls are misleading. Mm -hmm. And I think he underestimated Bill. Well, that's the second big mistake I think he did. But you know, you called, they just didn't call the right people. Yeah, yeah, right, right, exactly. exactly. In fact, Kane, Tom Kane, as I mentioned in the book, uh, said that you know if Case had spent more money, he would have been reelected. He would have been in the primary because Case was very frugal in spending money. He didn't want, he said, I don't want to waste the public's money. So he raised $100,000 at a benefit 
where Henry Kissinger was the key speaker in April of 1978. But when the election was over and the primary was left open, he had over $50,000 in the bank. He just did radio ads. That was real money in those days. Yeah, radio bands and billboards. Yeah. And by the way, this is the Clifford case perfectly. After that, he has to keep the money. He uses that to fund the seed for the Clifford case professorship. Oh. <laughs> I don't think George Santos would have done that. <laughs> well, um, uh, uh, Bill has done, uh, I haven't seen it, uh, a kind of what would, it's a PowerPoint for a yes, set of slides. slides. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so that, that people who aren't as well informed as I think this group happens to be uh, would be able to see some pictures and some dates mm -hmm. uh, and be able to learn from that. Sure. So we've selected what? The, uh, About five or six the slides. Yeah. So we want to show those to you before we ask you if you have any questions, if that's all right. This is Clifford Case's father. Um, and one of the reasons Clifford Case went to Rutgers is because his father went to Rutgers. And his uncle, Clarence Case, who, by the way, was Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court and actually was a, um, an attorney at the Hall Mills murder case. Huh. You want a scandal, that's really a scandal. Uh, here's Case and Rutgers Band. Um, and uh, he looks pretty happy. That's his wife, Ruth Smith. I would say she was an absolutely essential part of his political life. She was his most trusted advisor. They were married for 54 years. There's the family. This is Clifford Case in the center. On the far left is his daughter, Mary Jane. Next is his wife, Ruth. Anne is to his right, and that is son, Clifford Case III, who also becomes an attorney, by the way. There's uh, Mr. Nixon, Mr. Case. That was Paul Robeson. <laughs> okay, here's uh, Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act in 1968, and Case standing there at a second from the left. Uh, what happened was that uh, Case very strongly felt that the first Civil Rights Act of 64 was not sufficient, and they had to keep striving for more. So this one actually was an uh, added about housing and Native Americans, and he was a full-time advocate on civil and human rights. I show you this one because I think it's very critical that people understand the nature of bipartisanship it was not just political, it was friendship. And Hubert Humphrey and Clifford Case were good friends. In the 64, when Johnson asked Humphrey to lead the civil rights legislation, Humphrey chose Case to be the floor manager for Title VII, which is about employment. But the bottom says to Clifford Case, friend and colleague with admiration, Hubert Humphrey. And he wrote a letter to Case's granddaughter, who was doing an independent study in Washington, and said, there's no question in my mind, and I'm paraphrasing that you, passage of the 64 Act, your father was essential for that. This is important, I think, because People have a misunderstanding in the general public, not you, but in the general public, that all the work gets done by senators. No, it gets done by the staff. So Case's staff was very loyal. And to his right, the woman with the glasses is Frances Henderson. She was one of the very few women who were administrative assistants. That means that his next, his right-hand person. At that time, very few women held. He appointed her after his first, Sam Zagoria, was appointed to the NLRB. But Case had a very loyal staff, and John Farmer, the older John Farmer, who wrote for the North News, said that most people in Washington, their staff turns over. Case's does not. Why? He pays them well, he never embarrasses them. This case in Vietnam, here he is talking to actual New Jersey veterans. This is Frank Church, who worked with him on the end of the war amendment, Menachem Begin. This is important. We didn't talk about it very much. But in 1975, <clears throat> the uh, United States and a number of European right. countries signed the Helsinki Final Act. You may or may not be aware there was no treaty to end World War II. The boundaries had never been finalized. The Soviet Union wanted that. And the West gradually came to the idea, well, they want that, we want something. We want guarantees on human rights. 
Well, the United States signed it, Ford signed it, but then Mills and Fenwick from New Jersey and Case sponsored legislation to create what was called the Helsinki Commission in the, in the Congress, which would monitor whether the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries would actually hold up to the things they said they would. It was very important because that dissonance, the hypocrisy of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact over time helped to undermine their governments. But this is the bill and Ford signing it right there. And then here is the last one I'm going to show you. This is the Government Ethics Act that was passed in 1978, 20 years after Case initially proposed it. And it says at the bottom, with thanks and admiration to Senator Clifford Case, Jimmy Carter, October 1978. Now by this time, Case had already lost the primary. He was leaving the Senate in January 1979, but he never stopped working. He was working till the end. In fact, this is a funny story. Bill Bradley came to Case and said, you know, if you left early, I could get a head start. And Case said, no. <laughs> no. Because, he said, you're going to go to the bottom of the line now, Bill. You've got to learn all the rules. Because remember, when Case, four terms, on appropriations, on foreign relations, what he lost, he took his seniority with him. So Bill Bradley came in at the end of the line. And in the Senate, seniority matters. You don't get to be a chairman. You don't get to be a ranking member until you earn it and get up on those committees after years of work. So let me stop there, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Was there some interaction between Clifford Case and Senator Joe McCarthy in the Congress at one point? Absolutely. Senator Case was not senator yet. He was running for the Senate in 1954. Of course, Joe McCarthy had already been wreaking havoc, in my opinion, through his investigations. And what happened was that in July of 1954, Clifford Case came out and said, I do not think Joe McCarthy should be reappointed as a chairperson of any Senate committee, period. Well, the anti-Case conservatives in New Jersey said this is the end of Clifford Case. In fact, they referred to him as Stalin's choice for the Senate. Because Case had taken on the most ardent anti-communist in the Senate, but he felt that McCarthy was anti-civil liberties, he was a bully, and it wasn't good for the Republican Party. So when Case won the election, he proposed that McCarthy be stripped of his committee chair. Well, he learned very quickly that as a freshman senator, nobody else was going to buy that. Because Eisenhower needed a senior senator who had influence, and McCarthy had seniority. So he actually didn't get what he wanted, but three years later, McCarthy leaves the Senate and dies. But he was definitely not a McCarthy supporter. Sir? In today's terms, uh, wouldn't case be called a rhino? Republican name only. When I, in 1964, I worked in Harrison Williams' office. Mm -hmm. And my first assignment was to look, Williams was going to run against Bernard Shanley. Can we find a difference between the Republicans and the Democrats? And what we did was an analysis of the votes of Harrison Williams and Clifford Case, and there was no daylight between them. But they were, they, they really, uh, there was no difference. So I think Clifford Case today would, um, not only would he be called a rhino, he'd be called a traitor by certain members of the Republican Party. And I think that's a sad commentary. Because Case was very committed to a broadly defined Republican Party. He made many speeches, in the early 60s in particular, for those of us who go back that far, the John Birch Society was a growing menace in this country. And in fact, in the 1964 election, when Goldwater was nominated, one of the issues for Case with Goldwater was that, are you going to repudiate white supremacy? And the John Birch Society was part of that, and Goldwater wouldn't. You know what Case said? He said, I'm not supporting you for the presidency. And this is a Republican senator saying he's not going to support the nominee for his own party. I don't think you're going to see too many people do that today. The other thing he did, though, is he said, I'll support all the municipal and county and legislative candidates in New Jersey, which he did. 
But I think you're right that he would be called that. But you know what? I think the sad part of it is that the party that Case wanted is one where he believed reasonable and civil disagreement could happen. And you could still agree on big issues and big policy issues. I'm not convinced that's going to happen anymore. The sad commentary, I think. But you're right about the whole uh, thing with Harrison Williams. <laughs> if you look at Case's voting record, and you look at uh, in Congressional Quarterly, they have these analyses of how many times a person voted with the majority of their party. Case rarely voted with the majority of the Republicans on many issues during the, particularly in the Johnson and the uh, Nixon administration. Civil rights legislation, which the Republican Party started in the Senate, um, was originated in the Senate. But I, I thought I remember reading something a long time ago that in in the House there was a bunch of Republicans led by Tom Curtis, uh, who was also promoting very strongly civil rights legislation um, in the middle and late 50s. Um, were they competing? Did they work together, or which came first? Well, I think, yeah, you're right. I think what I meant by that was that the Eisenhower administration actually introduced civil rights legislation. You know, um, in 19, I think it was in 1955 or 56, this was after the Brown decision, when the Eisenhower administration had decided they were not going to oppose the Brown decision, even though Eisenhower himself had reservations about the idea of the federal government or the Supreme Court telling states what to do, he felt once they had done it, we got to get on board. And he was actually, Eisenhower was actually quite disappointed in the second Brown decision, you know, with the all deliberate speed statement. He felt it didn't give much direction. So what ended up happening, I think, was that that Civil Rights Act that was passed in 57, which was initially much stronger and had been watered down, particularly through the opposition of conservative Republicans and Southern Democrats, was not anything what Case and the NAACP and even the Eisenhower people wanted, but they wanted something. And even though Lyndon Johnson, um, you know, was very ambitious and wanted that to help to become president, we have to give him credit. It was the first thing since Reconstruction. The first time a Civil Rights Act had actually been passed since Reconstruction. And it was not very good. It was not enough. But it was something. And, you know, what I think people often forget about is how vociferous the Southern resistance was. It was huge. You know, I mean, you had school districts in Virginia closing down entirely so they wouldn't desegregate. In Tennessee also. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, when you get to the 1960s with Kennedy, uh, Case was very critical of Kennedy, saying, where, where is the civil rights? Where are we going here? You know, what's happening? And I know in the book I go into the you know the struggles that Martin Luther King and others had. They thought Kennedy was really not convincing them about this. Kennedy's speech in '63, where he actually says we need to move, and that and then they introduce the legislation is a change. And then of course Kennedy dies, and the whole question is will Johnson pick it up? And he did a great job. You know he actually moved that forward. But I think the other thing about it with Case, just to get back to him is that um, he understood that there had to be a different strategy. So Humphrey and he and others came up with a strategy to defeat the segregationists. It's very interesting. Because the segregationists, these Southerners like Russell, Strom Thurmond, and all them, they knew the rules. They could tie up in knots on the rules. So what they did was they came up with a newsletter. The Senate supporters of civil rights published a daily newsletter. The daily newsletter, a minio, had all the arguments against the Southern Democrats. And the Southern Democrats said, what is this? This is outrageous. They said, we're just doing what you've done for years. And they were fully organized. And finally, they got it through. Is that a question? Thank 
you so much for being here. I was just curious to know, what do you think he would think about the two candidates that are running for president today? And do you think the two-party system, do you have any thoughts about the, the two-party system today? I have plenty of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try to give you what I think Clifford Case would say. Uh, first of all, I think he would find the Republican, the presumptive Republican nominee appalling. And I'll go through at least three reasons why. First of all, I think the presumptive nominee is a bigot. There's evidence, overwhelming evidence to that effect. Number two, he's an authoritarian. And if you look at Case's work on the issue of restraining executive power, which was extensive. He really felt that the Congress had dropped the ball, to like to use a better term, by allowing the presidency to have too much power. Nixon impounds funds. Nixon decides we're going to make sure that if I sign executive agreements, that's all there is to it. Well, in 1972, Clifford Case sponsored a bill called the Case Act, became law that said within 60 days, all executive agreements have to be sent to the Senate. Well, Nixon didn't like that, because the presidency, for a long time, it had unfettered control of all this. So the reality is that Case and others felt, and this was evident in the War Powers Act in 73, too, that the presidency had to be reined in. How much power is the executive going to have? And he was very concerned about this. But another reason why I think he'd be appalled by the current nominee is that the current nominee, or presumptive nominee, is totally focused on advancing himself and has no interest in the country. No interest in the idea of a country for all the people. He may view the country as part of his own narcissistic image, but Clifford Case, for example, strongly supported the change in immigration laws in the 1960s. 1965 Immigration Act was a huge change. It ended the Chinese Exclusion Act. It ended the restrictions on Asians. It changed the whole process. Well, this guy, the current nominee, wants to go back to that idea before that. And I think the other thing about it is that Clifford Case was a gentleman. He believed that we should have civilized dialogue. He never used ad hominem attacks. He never criticized people for their appearance. He would disagree with them politely about their positions. Barry Goldwater, and he probably disagreed on 90% of policy, but they were friends. And I think it's important. You know, when Lyndon Johnson left the White House, Clifford Case wrote him a letter congratulating him on all his achievements, even though he had been critical of him about Vietnam. And I think we've lost a lot of that civility. All right, your second question was a two-party system. Clifford Case firmly believed in the two-party system. He felt that it was important to have. In fact, after he lost the primary to Bell, a couple of months later, he said, I'm going to endorse Bell. He didn't campaign for him because he and Bell disagreed on a lot of stuff. But he said, I endorse him because we need a Republican from New Jersey in the Senate because we have Harrison Williams. We need to have both parties have strength. He believed that. I think today the party system is very weak. In fact, when Case left the Senate in 79, he did an interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer. And one of the things he was lamenting was the rise of political consultants who were focused on celebrity and marketing because he had seen that trend start already. Let's remind ourselves what happened in 78. Clifford Case was the preferred nominee of the Republican establishment in New Jersey. Richard Leone was the Democratic preferred nominee by Brendan Byrne in the Democratic establishment. Neither Case nor Leone won. Bell beat Case, Bill Bradley beat Leone. Bill Bradley had never run for anything. Celebrity. Case saw this as a real problem. It was gonna weaken parties, and it was gonna make individuals who were outside of the party structure more powerful. He was concerned. So I think today you see that, I mean, the nominee of the Republicans is Exhibit A, I think, isn't he? Celebrity apprentice. <laughs> Anybody else? 
I get to thank you. Oh. <laughs> and thank you for coming to Princeton, to oh, the library. It's my pleasure. And thank you for writing your book. And thank you for making it something that can inspire people as well as give them information. I think it's very important. So well, it, it, if it's OK, I want to read one thing. Sure. Book. A benediction. Well, it's not a benediction. It's, it's just a little uh, commentary about Case, because I think it's important that you know what he, would, what people felt about him when, at the end. Um, let me just find it here. Okay, here we go. Here's what um, Peter Rodino said about Clifford Case. Peter Rodino, of course, was the uh, chair of the Watergate Committee in the House in 1973, and a longtime colleague of Case, but a Democrat. That's in County. Right? That's right. Essex. 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 Like about the same thing. <laughs> he, said, he said, speaking personally, I've never known a man, a more decent human being than Clifford Case. He taught, me, he taught us how to live with dignity and how to serve the people with integrity and honor. I hope that as we honor Cliff Case today, we can learn from the man and his principles, which help to chart a certain portion of our nation's history, for they are timeless in their simplicity and strength. And then Joe Michaels, who was an NBC uh, television reporter for many years, and known Case for a long time, he said this in a TV editorial after Case died. Clifford Case could get as angry as a man could possibly be, but he was just too civilized to make what newsmen call good copy by saying something harsh or wounding. Clifford Case went through his life wanting to think well of people, even when some of them did their best to make that almost impossible. <laughs> he believed that people could be helped by intelligent government action, and that government, which represents all the people, has an obligation to do something about the plight of the weakest. I think that sort of. Sums it up. That's where we began. That's right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Ingrid.